Well, greetings, everyone. It is a pleasure to welcome you to a wonderful celebration on the occasion of the 130th birthday of Norman Rockwell. I'm Laurie Norton Moffitt, Director and CEO of Norman Rockwell Museum. And today we will be connecting members of the Norman Rockwell family from across the country and across the continent. We are broadcasting today from Massachusetts to California and Canada. And we have a very exciting program for you, uh, connecting three generations of Norman Rockwell's family. And our chief curator, Stephanie Plunkett, will be introducing everyone. And uh, we'll have a wonderful conversation on the incredible creativity of this very special family, uh, starting with Norman Rockwell's um, creativity. But I think you'll hear that each member is an artist in their own right and have a lot of wonderful ideas to share. I am here in North Adams, Massachusetts at the home of Jarvis and Nova Rockwell. And Jarvis is Norman Rockwell's oldest son. And he and his wife, Nova, have warmly welcomed uh, me to broadcast from here with them. And you'll very shortly uh, be in conversation with Jarvis. And I just wanted to note that we hope to have time for questions and answers at the end of the program. And if you would put your questions in the Q&A, we'll read those later and we'll uh, invite conversation and, and questions to answer them. So with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Stephanie Plunkett, the Chief Curator of Norman Rockwell Museum. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for coming. It's really fun. We've got a great crowd in the, in the room here, um, many people online. And I'd like to thank my colleague, Alyssa Blumenthal, for her assistance with this program. So if anybody has questions and you're physically in the room, she's here as well. Uh, many thanks to um, Alexa and Lori, uh, who are behind the scenes working to make sure that all of our technology works well. So uh, with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to three generations of Norman Rockwell's family. Uh, as Lori just mentioned, it is actually the 130th uh, birthday of Rockwell, who was born on this day, 130 years ago. And we've been very fortunate to um, have participation from uh, an incredibly creative uh, group of family members. And what we're going to talk about today um, certainly is um, the creativity of those family members and the really interesting life directions that they have taken. But we've also asked them to talk a little bit about the three senior uh, Rockwell members uh, who include who will include Norman Rockwell's three sons, uh, the sons that he and uh, wife Mary Barstow Rockwell shared. And so we'll first hear from Jarvis Rockwell and, and then hear a little bit about Tom Rockwell and about Peter Rockwell. Uh, we've also asked family members to talk about their favorite Rockwell paintings, which is um, always interesting to hear, and uh, we hope you enjoy this wonderful discussion. Uh, as Lori said, if you have questions uh, at the end or during the program, please don't hesitate to put them in the Q&A. So um, I'd like to start by introducing our panelists. The first is Jarvis Rockwell, the oldest son of Norman, Norman and Mary Barstow Rockwell. He began his artistic career drawing portraits of his neighbors and friends and taking classes at New York's Art Students League and the National Academy of Design. Following his service in the Korean War, he attended the Boston Museum School and the Los Angeles County Art Institute. Since 1979, his collection of toys has grown to include hundreds of thousands of pieces, which range from classic action figures to carved animals, mythical monsters, Happy Meal toys, and everything in between. He also has great figurines that portray politicians, celebrities, and artists. And his art explores the relationships between figures and the narratives that interactions among these toys produce. So you're gonna be seeing some of these in a few minutes in our slides. His art has been included in exhibitions here at the Norman Rockwell Museum and at Mass MoCA, at the, at the New Museum in New York, and um, in many other places. Dr. Jeffrey Rockwell is a professor of philosophy and digital humanities at the University of Alberta in Canada, 
Jeffrey, if you could just wave. <laughs> there he is, he did. Um, he studied philosophy at Haverford College and the University of Toronto, and he is an Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute Fellow. Jeffrey has published on textual visualization and analysis, AI ethics, and computing in the humanities. And he is a co-developer of Boyan Tools, a suite of text analysis tools. He's the son of Peter Rockwell, Norman Rockwell's youngest son. And he is, um, yes, I'm sorry. He is the son of Peter Rockwell, Norman Rockwell's youngest son, and he is Rockwell's grandson. Margaret Rockwell is an accomplished author and the manager of the Norman Rockwell Family Agency. Her many books include Faithful Friends, Norman Rockwell and His Dogs, Norman Rockwell's Growing Up in America, A Norman Rockwell Christmas, and Norman Rockwell Chronicles of America. She is married to Jeffrey Rockwell and is Norman Rockwell's granddaughter-in-law. Tom Rockwell, Hi, Tom. <laughs> is chief creative officer at the Exploratorium in San Francisco um, in the Museum of Science, Art, and Human Perception. Since joining the Exploratorium in 2005, he's led the exhibits and media departments in developing new galleries for the museum when it moved to the waterfront in 2013, including the popular Geometry Playground. Prior to this, he founded Painted Universe, which featured such exhibitions as It's a Nano World and Exploring the Science of Art. Tom is Peter Rockwell's son okay, and Jeffrey's brother. Peter Rockwell, young Peter, uh, is a senior technical UI director at Epic Games in Canada, where he has worked on such popular video games as Fortnite. He was also technical lead and senior programmer at Behavior Interactive in Montreal and received a Bachelor of Arts from Concordia College in Computation Arts. He is the son of Jeffrey and Margaret Rockwell and is Norman Rockwell's great grandson. So um, thank you all so much for joining us today. We're thrilled to have you. We're thrilled to introduce you to Jarvis Rockwell. Lori, would you like to start the discussion with Jarvis? We've got some great, great <laughs> photos of Jarvis here with a couple of his wonderful drawings. And I think assembling his toys in um, the window of a museum in New York. Yeah, so Jarvis, um, Stephanie has found some wonderful drawings that you created and also a picture of you in New York City installing, I think this was your first oh, exhibition. The new, the, the new museum, I think. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, I'm, only that I did it, it was in a window in the museum. And uh, I and uh, a friend of mine drove me down there in his truck with the with the toys and I set them up in the window. And and uh, uh, I had no trouble at all. I, I, I knew just what I wanted to do. I just, just set them all up and, and then backed off. <laughs> it's really fun. And um, do you know that your your great niece works at the new museum now? No, I didn't know that. No. Yes, Althea, Jeffrey <laughs> and Peggy and Margaret, Margaret's daughter and Peter's sister. Yeah. Well, you're having a family reunion online here. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's, a, there's the, the pyramid. Yes. Can you tell us about the pyramids and what inspired your Maya series? I I I I I was I was in Great Barrington and I had uh, two rooms it was the, the and the walls were covered with shelves and covered with toys and uh there was some young man that came to see me I don't I'm sorry I don't remember his name now and and anyway I, I, I so we uh, I, I somehow they got the idea that I would do a pyramid and and uh and then uh, then I came I came up here, up here to uh, to uh, uh, Williamstown North Adams and and uh, and they had the pyramid there and 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 uh, we just put the toys on it and it, you can see there's uh, there's a lot of different beings there there are uh, they're not altogether friendly to each other 
How did you first start collecting all of these people and characters and creatures? I, I have no idea. I, I, I just, I just, uh, well, I'd, well, I, well I, I, I'd always loved Hieronymus Bosch and Bruegel and, and uh, Durer. And uh, uh, so, but but Hieronymus Bosch particularly, and and I was I I I, uh, I guess it was, it was just suddenly it was a chance to a chance to do that, you know, because uh, it, it's an extraordinary thing this that, that, that in the United States and in well in, in, and in Europe, but I, I guess mostly in the United States, we have we have we we've we've we, we've had the money and and we and we. And we've we've just taken all of these uh, mythic characters and and uh, strange characters, and and uh, sent the designs to Asia, and these Asians over there must have their eyes wide open and say, "Oh my God, here's some more," and and uh, and, so, and so they have to do them. <laughs> they said they make these figures. So I remember when you made these boxes. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I love doing those boxes. What were your ideas when you were putting these boxes together? Oh, I just, I just, uh, I just, just put them together. I, 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 uh, uh, I had, I had all I needed. I had rugs and furniture and uh, and the people <laughs> and so on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they're a lot of fun. Here's another one. Oh uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know where they are now. Well, these two are in the collection of Norman Rockwell Museum. Oh, they are. Yes, they are. <laughs> oh, cool. I'll have to come down and see them sometime. <laughs> anytime, anytime. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah. Yes, I think. Oh, I, I just—it was just—it was just wonderful to have all of these. You know, it was—it was Hieronymus Bosch at home. <laughs> Mashing all these worlds together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, you also started working on creating walls. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I uh, God, I, I it, it, it's quite a while ago now, you know. And 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 I, uh, I, I, uh, I'm sometimes I'm just I'm flabbergasted. She what I've done. <laughs> well, I've seen right here in your home. You have a beautiful wall where you've drawn. Oh yes, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. In your former. And home. then I have, I have, I have. Uh, all of these people all over the place in the house. Well, tell us about the people in front of you here uh, on the table. Uh, well, uh, that, that's, uh, what, what are they, Nova? They, they, what did I call them? Well, it's, it's a committee. It's, the, they, it's were, the committee. It's they, the committee. committee? Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and, and, and this, this old lady is, is, uh, is more or less uh, in charge. And this is Miss <laughs> And uh, um, yes, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I yes, see yes, her. And, yes. uh, and this is Mr. Uh, this is the president, and and is this Mr. Fa Dr. Fauci? Yes, yes, and I and I can't remember, I'm afraid, the, the name of the other ones. I can't remember, <laughs> and you have some uh, cupid dolls as well, uh, yeah, so it's yeah. quite a convention here. Yeah, there, there's it's 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 amazing the way the way uh. We in this country have done this. I'm, I'm, I think it's, it's been, it's been, a, been a godsend to our country that we've been able to do this. Well, it's a form of freedom of expression. Exactly, exactly, yes, exactly. Yes, uh, in yeah, in another yeah. medium. Yeah, there it is. So my God, look at that grand and then, Maya. And then they, then they, then they ship the whole thing to, uh, to uh, Arizona. Arizona. Yeah, to Arizona. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. And I did it down there. It's, it's spectacular. Many yeah. worlds colliding, <laughs> communicating. I couldn't believe it. Oh, there, oh, there we, oh, there, yeah, there, yeah, yeah. Yes. There's Bill Sharkey over in the corner. Yes, you remember that um, it's I... one of the pictures you posed for. What's that? Uh, I think that's you posing. Yeah, with, yeah, uh, yeah, as yeah, a young yeah. man in yeah. the Stay in Grace picture, yeah. as um, you and your family so often did. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jarvis. That was really fun to have a glimpse of your work and your creative mind and thank you very much okay sure so i'd like to um invite margaret rockwell to talk a little bit about um the middle son who is thomas rockwell a very accomplished author thank you margaret hmm. it's my great pleasure to be able to tell you about norman and mary rockwell's second son tom 
Though Thomas Rhodes Rockwell focuses his creative energy towards the written word, he is a poet and a writer. He was born in New Rochelle on March 13, 1933. So next month, he will celebrate his 91st birthday. When he was when he was just a toddler, so if I could see, I have the next slide. When he was just a toddler, his father used Tom as a model in this lovely post cover of a little boy looking into his grandfather's pocket for a puppy. The old man is based on the artist's memory of his eccentric Uncle Gil. The enthusiastic Uncle Gil always got his holidays mixed up and was a bit of a family embarrassment. But young Norman cherished his uncle, who he thought epitomized the spirit of Christmas all year round. So in this painting, he com connects his young son to his beloved uncle. And in the next slide, we, we have uh, we, Tom um, posing for a painting. He was, Tom grew up in Arlington, Vermont, and he was very close to the Edgerton family who ran a dairy for, farm next door to the Rockwells. Norman Rockwell had Tom pose beside Tom's good friend, Buddy Edgerton, for the Boy Scout painting, A Guiding Hand. Tom is the younger boy on the left, learning to tie a knot. And the next slide, we see that Tom also modeled for the painting, Christmas Homecoming. He is the young man in the brown plaid shirt with his hands in his pocket as the community welcomes their young student home from the holidays. Although you can see in the reference photo, Tom has his hands in the air. Jarvis posed as the returning student. His mother, Mary, is embracing him with Norman Rockwell looking on, holding his pipe. Peter is beside Grandma Moses, and he is wearing glasses to the left of the canvas. Next slide, please. So Tom would become a celebrated children's book author. He is most known for the classic How to Eat Fried Worms. Some of his other published titles include How to Fight a Girl. And the next slide shows you how to Get Fabulously Rich, and a book of poetry called Emily Stew. Tom helped, uh, if I could have the next, uh, the next uh, one too, thank you. Tom helped his father, uh, helped Tom, I'm sorry, there's a dog barking. Tom helped his father's autobiography, helped write his father's autobiography, My Adventures as an Illustrator. He updated it after his father's death, and Tom's daughter, Abigail, wrote the in introduction to the most recent edition of the autobiography. You can see the most recent edition of the autobiography on the left. Tom, Tom, with his brother's support, established the Norman Rockwell Family Agency to promote and preserve his father's legacy. He ran the agency for many years. This photo shows the three sons planting a tree at the museum's opening in 1993. Tom is in the middle with Peter on the left and Jarvis on the right. Peggy, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, you've been such a great friend to the museum and we've actually worked on lots of interesting projects yes, closely with Peggy, most recently in a Rockwell NFT. Thank you, Peggy. I'm pleased to introduce you to Jeffrey Rockwell, who will be talking about his father, Peter, who was a very accomplished sculptor and stone carver. Hello, uh, Jeffrey Rockwell here. I'm going to talk about my father, Peter Rockwell. And um, Peter was born in New Rochelle in 1936. He, um, uh, he grew up mostly in Arlington, Vermont, but they moved to Stockbridge uh, later on. He got married to uh, my, our mother, uh, Cynthia Ide, in 1958. And uh, soon after this, uh, soon after in 1961, he got a small fellowship. He went to Haverford College in, in Pennsylvania, which is actually where I went and, and my daughter uh, Thea went. 
uh, in 19, uh, and he graduated about 19, I think it was 1959. Um, in 1961, he got a small fellowship to study carving technique in Carrara, which are the marble quarries, the famous sort of statuary marble uh, comes from Carrara that people like Michelangelo carved and stuff like that. And he got this fellowship to go there. And instead of buying a round trip ticket, uh, to go and come back, he bought two one-way tickets for himself and 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 uh, Cynthia, or as we call her, Cinny. And uh, I I was 18 months at the time, and apparently I came for free. I was small enough to be a, a sort of freebie. So essentially, in 1961, he moved to Italy. In 62, he came down from the uh, the the town of Massa and Carrara, and they moved to Rome, and that's essentially where they lived until until he was, um, you know, I'm, I can't remember the exact year, but once he was quite old, we had to we brought him back from the states, and he passed in uh, he passed in uh, uh, Danvers, Massachusetts. You can see on the right, you can see a photograph that's. Massa from the Nicoli studio where he would where he was studying carving technique and that's all of us so my father is sort of sitting, uh, my mother uh, is sitting in front of them on my father's shoulders is Tom who is going to talk after me I'm to the left there holding uh, I'm the I'm the older one and I'm holding one of my twin brothers and sisters I think I'm holding John but I'm not entirely sure so, as I said, he was a sculptor. He's de, he did all sorts of works, including uh, numerous commissions. But one of the ones that those of you who visit the museum can see right next to the parking lot is Grendel's Folly, which is which uh, he carved, uh, intending it to be a climbing statue. So if you're there with little kids, or even if you're a little kid or whatever like that, you should feel free to climb it. And I, I hope nobody stops you from that. Uh, he actually... He actually carved this with my friend uh, Gillum. Gillum Erickson was a good friend of mine, best man at our wedding, and one of his sort of students who learned stone carving from him and worked with him on this. He got a commission uh, at a sort of crucial point in his career to do gargoyles for the Washington Cathedral. And there are a number of, uh, there are eight of them, which if you've got binoculars, you can go and, and look at. But I've got to say that that actually inspired him to do all sorts of monsters and gargoyle-like figures. In fact, uh, we have a number of them in our house. And uh, but they're all I, I'm pleased to say they're all generally sort of happy gargoyles or or gargoyles that are uh, enjoying life. There you can see Peter posing in uh, the the soda jerk. He's uh, obviously the the young man on the on the left. And there you see him with my grandfather. Uh, they're, uh, I guess, talking about the connoisseur. Um, on that note, I should mention that my father later in life actually became a, an expert in ancient stone carving technique. And he wrote, uh, uh, wrote and co-wrote a number of uh, important books. He wrote uh, The Art of Stoneworking, which was published in 1993 by Cambridge and with uh, an art historian, Vidya Deheja, he create he wrote a book, The Unfinished, The Stone Carvers at Work in the Indian Subcontinent, which was published in 2016. Um, I'm going to stop there and uh, pass it on. Thank you, Jeffrey. That was wonderful. Yes, as Jeffrey mentioned, we have a number of Peter's original sculptures on our grounds. We have tumblers that you can climb on, Grendel's Folly. Um, and we, we won't stop anybody from climbing for sure. But we also have a wonderful collection of his work, um, which we exhibited a few years ago. Okay, well now um, we've invited our panelists to talk a little bit about paintings that either had special meaning for them or that they recall something interesting in, in their background. So um, I'm gonna actually ask Jeffrey to jump in again uh, because he actually appears in this painting. Uh, which is called Golden Rule. Yeah, so uh, this is one of my favorite paintings, and for a number of reasons. Uh, first and foremost is this is the only painting in which I appear. And you can see me as a little baby <laughs> in the right-hand corner there. But it, it it's actually more important than that, uh, because uh, I'm being held by my grandmother, 
uh, Mary Barstow Rockwell. And this is significant because my grandmother passed before I was born. I'm the oldest grandson. And uh, she, so she, she never had a chance to actually hold me. So, and I was born in 59. And so Norman paints and brings us together in this painting. So I, I still find that uh, very touching. The painting's important to me for other reasons too. I, I, I'm trained as a philosopher, have my PhD in philosophy. I'm now, uh, it, Stephanie mentioned that, I, that I'm a fellow of the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. So I'm working on ethics, especially ethics and artificial intelligence. And of course, the golden rule is, is central to ethics. Um, those of you who, who care about this, you know, there you can, you, you, you probably know how the golden rule and various permutations shows up in Western ethics and in, in, in other cultures. This, this painting is important to me for that reason too. And, and lastly, I like, I like the diversity of the painting. I mean, this is one of a number of, of paintings where in which Norman Rockwell, who loved to travel, something that I love too, uh, and brought all sorts of props and things back from his, uh, his travels around the world. But here you see an example of where it compresses and gathers the um, uh, peoples from around the world. And I guess I really like that, uh, that diversity and that inclusion that, that uh, was important to him and is important to me. Thank you, Jeffrey. Very, very beautifully done. This is actually in the permanent collection of the Northern Rockwell Museum. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to see it, is, it is on view in our gallery. And next, I'd love to turn it over to Tom who has a couple of uh, pieces that, that he'll discuss. Hello, everybody. Tom Rockwell here from, from the West Coast, from the Bay Area. And um, I, I chose two different paintings. The first one I chose was the, the boy in, in, in a dining car. Um, and the reason I chose this is it's got some sentimental value for me. I mean, first of all, I, just, I actually love the, the, the simplicity of it. And I love just sort of the, the square frame behind it and the kind of almost black and white landscape. But posing on the left there is my dad again. <laughs> we, we, we've seen him in a couple of paintings. And um, this a photograph of this was actually part of an exhibition in Rome that in fact, Lori, Lori was um, at the opening of in Rome, Italy, which is where, as Jeffrey was saying, we, we all grew up. And so that was a special moment when I could take a picture of my dad there. You see him on the right, a picture of my dad next to himself as a, I don't know exactly how old he was at then, but maybe like 10 years old or something like that. He was, he was pretty young, 10 or 12, something like that. So um, the other reason this painting is kind of special to me is um, I work in museums. That's what I do. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but um, my very first museum job was actually in the summer of 79. And I came to the States from Italy to work at the Norman Rockwell Museum, which was then at the old corner house. And I worked as a guide showing people around the paintings, but I would stand next to this painting and I would stand in a profile position, just like my dad did there. And over the course of the summer, about three or four people said, that's really weird. You look like that person. And once they said that, I would tell them, I would tell them that who my grandfather was and they were very excited. So anyway, interesting moment for me of connecting father and then my future career and all of that. So if you go to the next slide, the next slide is really one of my favorite paintings and it's many people's favorite painting. Um, this is Shuffleton's Barber Shop. Um, this is a painting that I, I just, I, I, I just love the composition. I love the intimacy. I love the restraint in many ways, and I love all the detail. Um, I, I I don't know that much about the history of it. I should probably get Stephanie or somebody to tell me more about all of the details in it. But one of the things that I really love about it is just sort of the the you know just a tiny fraction of the overall composition is devoted to the people and to this very intense group of people practicing their music. And all the rest of it is all about the space and it's all about all of these little details. And if you look carefully at this painting, there's a crack in the glass in the foreground. You've got the painted sign, the barbershop sign on the glass. There's a cat sitting in the foreground. There are boots warming by the, by the wood stove. And of course, then all of the just details of a barbershop that's just sort of stopped functioning as a barbershop from the day and has become home to this little sliver of this moment of these people who are intent upon their music and 
It reminds me of, of Pop's incredible attention to detail and also his dedication to his craft, just like these gentlemen who are playing in the back room there. So that's it for me. Thank you, Tom. Beautifully said. Um, I think as, as Tom said, this painting really focuses on all those wonderful details. And it is unusual for Rockwell, who normally puts his figures right in the foreground of, of his artwork. So um, we also uh, have seen studies that show that he initially did not have the window frame in this composition. Uh, so you can imagine what a difference that makes, because if you're looking through the window, it really gives it that sense of intimacy and, and wonder. And moving on to Margaret, who has chosen uh, Main Street uh, Stockbridge, Home for Christmas. Thank you, Margaret. Yes. This is my favorite painting. The painting's about the past and it's about, and it also speaks to the future as well as the present. So I wrote my PhD thesis on urban renewal projects in Buffalo, New York and Hamilton, Ontario. And I'm very interested in the historic preservation of buildings. So this painting speaks to me. Norman Rockwell usually tells stories using humans and sometimes animals, but buildings tell the story in this painting. The buildings tell his story, his story in Stockbridge. At the heart of the painting is a glowing Christmas tree in the upstairs window above a store. Norman Rockwell had that window installed himself because that is where his first Stockbridge studio was when he moved to town in 1953. I think it must have been difficult for Norman Rockwell to leave Arlington, Vermont for Stockbridge, a move he made out of love and concern for his wife, Mary, who needed treatment in town. But when he finished this painting in 1967, he had clearly grown to love Stockbridge. In 1957, he moved out of the upstairs studio to the studio behind his house. And he painted his little red studio in the far right hand corner of the painting. You can just barely see it behind the white house to the right of the Red Lion Inn. And on the far left side of the painting is the old corner house. When this painting was printed in McCall's magazine, Norman Rockwell was well aware that, his, that, his, that this building was at risk of demolition. He and, his wife Mary, Molly, he and his wife Molly were trying to help save the house with a group of Stockbridge citizens. Just maybe he dreamed that he could help save the building by exhibiting his paintings in the old corner house, which is exactly what happened. The old corner house eventually became the Norman Rockwell Museum, the precursor to the current museum. So that's why I say it's about the future. It's also about the future because this painting helps to preserve Stockbridge's lovely main street. It would be very difficult for someone to destroy these historic buildings thanks to this painting. It is an important place in the present because it, ex it is exhibited in its almost eight foot glory at the museum. And it is re reproduced every December on Stockbridge's main street as a big holiday celebration where the painting is brought to life. And that's why it's important to the past, to the future and the present. And that's why I always look for it when I visit the museum. Thank you. Thank you so much. Beautiful, beautifully said. I'm going to invite uh, Peter to jump in and talk about Triple Self Portrait and this great iteration of it by Richard Williams. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Peter Garth Rockwell from um, currently in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and yeah, in the triple self-portrait here on the left, I, I've always really liked this piece because it's Norman reflecting on his creative process and himself as an artist. And just like so many other Norman's works, there's there's lots of fun little details to look at and kind of like look deeply into, like the the portraits of Rembrandt and Picasso and Van Gogh on the on the on the top right of the of the canvas. Um, I'm I'm also fascinated by how Norman's work continues to be repurposed and remixed by current artists and pop culture. 
uh, such as this illustration um, from with the the Mad um, uh, the Mad Magazine's Alfred Newman character, kind of satirizing Norman's work, kind of tweaking and adjusting what it means and giving you another perspective on that. And I feel like there's so many, I, I feel like I've seen so many different versions and iterations, especially of this piece, but also of other Norman Rockwell pieces that have humorous or satirical ideas, political ideas are used for propaganda or pop culture references. And it's so fascinating that Norman Norman's work kind of lives on in this dimension of being reused by different artists. And I, I, if if I can think of like why that is, I feel like it's partly because of his technical precision of his paintings, uh, the popularity and widespread kind of reach of how how wide they went across like uh, across the U.S. especially, um, and their ability to kind of capture and distill maybe an idea that can then be used and repurposed for packaged with other ideas. So if we can go on to the next slide. Before I um, yep. I do that, go ahead. I'll go do ahead. That in one second. I just want to mention, um, in case you aren't aware, and probably you aren't, we're actually going to be having a Mad Magazine exhibition this coming mm -hmm. summer, starting in June. And so these two artworks uh, in the original will be side by side. So that'll be a lot of fun. That's great. That's fun. I'm showing. Um, this is the Freedom of Speech, um, Norman's painting on the left. And on the right is uh, actually a tweet that I saw very recently and very uh, like probably a month ago. It's it's a tweet and someone's using it to to make a, a point about how uh, small talk is important to them. Um, but I've been seeing this um, this image be used like every few weeks. I see it on on Twitter now X or or on Facebook or on Reddit, and it continues to kind of I, I think it's. I think it's increasing in popularity right now. And what I would describe this as is, is a meme, kind of a, a piece of media that is being copied and repurposed to kind of deliver an idea. And I looked this up on knowyourmeme.com, uh, which apparently says that this ver this like variant of the freedom of speech started in about 2020 um, and has been kind of growing or having a bunch of, in 2022, there was a bunch of examples of it. And now I'm seeing examples that are that are very recent. And it feels like it's people using this message of like, yeah, freedom of speech um, to kind of maybe give a controversial take on something, often like a humorous take on something of them kind of standing up and saying something to a crowd of people, even if it's not what the crowd wants to hear. Um, and I think what's like kind of funny, the, like a funny layer of that is Norman's original work um, was based on this town hall where a dissenter was arguing against building a school that had burned down. Um, so kind of in a lot of ways, I, I think like kind of a bad idea, like this, this person was talking about something that the society didn't want, but we were listening to this person. And I think it's funny that online posters are using this mess, this, this image, because they're in some ways they're saying, I'm this, my take is actually a bad one, but I'm going to, I'm going to kind of give it to you anyway. And I'm not sure they they're aware of that that kind of history to it, but it kind of I don't know it kind of sums up a lot of online discourse in itself. So I think that's pretty interesting. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for bringing these these to our attention. You're wonderful. So with that, um, I'd love to have each of our panelists talk a little bit about the kind of fascinating and interesting work that they are currently doing and the directions that they have taken in their own careers. So. I'll turn it back over to Jeffrey Rockwell, uh, Professor of Philosophy and Digital Humanities at the University of Alberta. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I should say as a professor, a big part of my work is teaching. And, uh, and with the pandemic, I ended up having to switch to teaching online. And so sitting in this very chair, uh, teaching various classes to students who often were, you know, had, had had left Edmonton, Alberta, and gone back to wherever they lived uh, to to be safe or to to be with their families. And I just I say this partly because some of you may have noticed behind me this uh, sculpture. This is by my father, and it's a sculpture that is about our our family. In fact, you might almost recognize that this panel here of the sculpt of the sculpture is in fact a re a sort of sculpted relief version of that photograph i showed of the uh, 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 of the family 
um, you know, with 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 one of the twins on my lap and and so on like that. So that's one thing I want to say. The screenshot that you see in front of you is one of the projects that uh, uh, I'm probably uh, most proud of and best known. I mean, I publish a lot of papers which three or four people in the world read. Uh, one of whom is the editor of the journal. Another one might be my mother or something like that. Um, and uh, but. But one of the things I've done, uh, you, Stephanie mentioned that I'm in philosophy and digital humanities. I've been bridging, bridging the humanities, especially uh, philosophy and the digital world. And one of the things I do a lot of is teaching digital literacy and developing software that allows people to experiment and play with different uh, uh, statistical and analytical and visualization techniques on the texts that matter to them. And so this is a project called Voyant Tools. Voyant Tools is, is on the web. It's in browser collection of some 25 text analysis and visualization tools. You can't break it. You don't have to install it. You can just sort of throw a text at it or use one of the texts that we have. And then it gives you access to all these different tools. And you, you probably recognize your sort of standard word cloud on the, on the left there. But we have lots of other statistical tools and stuff like that. And uh, this is now used widely, uh, actually around the world. We have it. We've translated the 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 skin of it, the labels, to fourteen languages. It's used widely around the world to teach digital literacy and to teach people uh, how computers can manipulate text. We have uh, built into it. We have some some what you might call artificial uh, artificial intelligence techniques like topic modeling and correspondence analysis. And one of the things I'm doing now is, of course, trying to adapt other uh, AI techniques, word embedding, and and some of these other techniques, ad adapt them in a way that makes them accessible, but accessible to be played with, not accessible in the sense of a Wikipedia en entry, but accessible in the way that you can fiddle with them. I like to call this tool fiddleware. You know, you you throw some text you like, uh, you know, a novel that you found or something that you've written. You throw it at it, and then you start playing with the gears and the levers and stuff like that. You learn through doing. So that's uh, the stuff uh, that I do. If if you're interested, uh, MIT Press uh, published a book, Hermeneutica, uh, which is partly about this tool. And I've got some other books that uh, it's also published. But I'm going to hand it back to Stephanie now. Well, Jeffrey, I'm wondering if you might just tell us how you got into this field, um, which is, I think, such a an important but unique niche in a way. Well, I think there were a couple of things. Uh, probably the the most important was procrastination. So okay. when I went back to, I was a high school, middle school teacher. I got married, uh, moved to Toronto. Peggy and I moved to to Toronto, and you know, I was supposed to be. I was in graduate school. I bought a computer. You know, I was a graduate student. Now you have to have a personal computer. And, you know, I was supposed to be writing important, deep, thoughtful papers about various subjects, but I started playing around with a computer. And then uh, I played around so much that, uh, but I did it sort of in the context of, of procrastination. And eventually I started working in computing at the University of Toronto. So while I was doing my graduate degree, I also became a, a specialist in the computer center working on instructional technology. And I was very lucky that that was right around the time, uh, around the time I finished my PhD, uh, was the time in which universities were beginning to try to explore these interdisciplinary intersections. And I was able to get a job in, in what at the time was called humanities computing or digital humanities, a job that allowed me to bring these two sides of of uh, my work and my interests together, and 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 now with uh, with working with the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, I can bring them together in another way because I'm increasingly looking at AI ethics and um, specifically dialogue. You know, how do we talk with these machines? Uh, anyone who's played with ChatGPT, that you know, as of November last year, all of a sudden these things are, are, are incredible. Um, interlocutors, if you will. Thank you. What a fascinating and very timely subject. 
Thomas Rockwell, Creative uh, Chief Officer at the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Tom, thank you for telling us a little bit about some of the things you've done. Sure. Th th this is fun because I get to learn more about my family than, than I actually knew about it. So I, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't get to hear so much from Jeffrey. I, I want to I fiddle with that fiddleware or whatever he called it. Um, that sounded pretty interesting. So again, Tom Rockwell, Chief Creative Officer at the Exploratorium, which is a science museum in San Francisco. And I do, when people ask me, how did you do the work that you do? Um, I, I combine a lot of art and science. And it's interesting because on the one side, I've got a very famous grandfather, Norman, of course, who, who is an artist. But on the other side of my family, you know, while, while Pop, as we would call him, Norman, was, was, you know, painting the four freedoms and helping the war effort that way, my other grandfather ran the underwater sound laboratory in New London, Connecticut, and actually spent a good part of World War II on submarines in the North Pacific perfecting acoustic instruments to detect U-boats. So he would he would be gone for weeks at a time and my mom didn't know where he was, but he was a scientist. So I somehow like am interested in combining both the art and the science. And this illustration that I did back in the 90s, this is a poster called The Size of Things. And what it is, is it's, if any of you ever saw, the, there's a famous video called The Powers of 10 and it sort of zooms from, you know, essentially it zooms from a picnic out to the edges of the known universe and then zooms back into DNA and atoms and nuclei and beyond. So this does that in one image and it's kind of like looking down a spiral staircase where the outer edges of the image are actually the, the extent of the known uh, of the known of the visible universe. And then as you sort of increasingly go down different parts of the image, each time you get smaller by by 10, essentially you get 10 times smaller. And as you go down, you reach the human scale. There's a human eye and a human hand sort of close to the center, but a little bit to the left of the image. And then you go down to the cellular level and the atomic level, all the way down to something called one Planck length, which is the theoretical minimum that space can be. Space cannot get smaller than one Planck length, in case you were wondering, which I'm sure you all were. Anyway, so I've been fascinated with ways to combine art and science for many years. And if you can go to the next slide, the um, I for the last 20 years, pretty much, I've worked at a place called the Exploratorium, which I've already mentioned is a museum of science and art and human perception. And it's it's right now on the San Francisco waterfront. We used to be over closer to the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, we moved there in 2013. And if you go to the next slide, we, we really combine the physical sciences. So this is a gallery that we have devoted to many light experiments. And the Exploratorium is famous just for highly interactive exhibits that allow the visitors or the learners, as we call them, to just explore the physical world, the phenomena of the world themselves. So there are lots of optical phenomena in this gallery. And we talked about it not only as light, but as seeing, the act of seeing. Then if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, this is at one end of the museum looking out onto the San Francisco Bay. We have our living systems gallery where we really talk about the biological world, the living world. And we, we, don't, we don't specialize in anything that involves um, calling a vet. They're all sort of, we call them charismatic microfauna, little things that you see under microscopes mostly, that are really the base of the food chain for everything else that lives on this planet. And then last but not least is, if you go to the next slide, is a gallery where we focus on what we call human phenomena. So this was an exhibition that was actually funded by the National Science Foundation called The Science of Sharing. And it really is about how humans collaborate and compete and in fact, if you really think about it, humans often collaborate in order to compete. That's what sports are. That's what politics is. And so we had exhibits where people actually do little experiments and notice how they can both be collaborative and competitive and sometimes sharing, but also sometimes less so. So those are kind of three linchpins, physics, biology, and what we call social sciences and the humanities um, at the Exploratorium. We also, um, our museum does work around the world. Um, this was a museum that we opened just recently, a little over a year ago in Brasilia, actually not far from their, from their Congress building on, on the main esplanade. And again, we designed and we helped them choose this building, which was by the architect Oscar Niemeyer. 
And so we, we helped rehab it and we designed and built all the exhibits and shipped them through the Panama Canal down to, to Brazil to populate this exhibit. And then the next slide. Um, and then we recently also opened a museum in Omaha, Nebraska. And this is one of my passions is to create um, interesting experiential exhibits about mathematics and about geometry. So on the left, you see something called the gyroid, which is a complex topological shape. And you see a girl climbing through that. So we so it's a geometric playground, essentially. And then on the right is what we call Stella, which is because it's a stellated icosahedron. Um, and again, you can walk into that and see that and sort of have the different colors projected onto you. So we create those kind of immersive, fun things that hopefully you learn, but more importantly, you create interesting memories of cool shapes that you wouldn't just see in general out there on the street. And that's it for me. Tom, thank you. What amazing work. I'm wondering, um, over the 20 years that you've been working with the Exploratorium, um, I mean, how have things changed? Have you uh, found that the kinds of exhibitions, the ways that you present them are very different from when you went there initially and the way that you think of them also? Yeah, well, I mean, one, that, that science of sharing exhibition that I showed earlier is kind of a good example of, I think, increasingly, there's more and more recognition that saying nature is out there and humans are in here and science is mostly to do with nature and not as much about humans, that's no longer defensible. As Jeffrey was talking about, artificial intelligence, if nothing else, makes that highly suspicious because obviously a technology that is created you know, in silicon is starting to do things that we thought only humans could do. So increasingly, there's more and more of a desire to, to talk about people and how people and nature collaborate and work together and how, how the, you can't always create a clear line between what is purely natural and what is human. In fact, I think that's that's no longer a definition that is particularly useful or a distinction. So that's one big change. But also, you know, the um, 2020 was a big deal, having to close museums and having to really think about what, what mattered to our publics. We went online. We did a lot of work online. I think also, you know, the, the, um, the, the racial reckoning in the U.S. has led museums to think really hard about who are their audiences and who they serve and how do they serve them, and to think more about, even in our case, worldwide collaborations. For example, um, just this week, I was up early in the morning to talk to a potential partnership that we're having in Kenya right now. So again, really embedding the museum in the larger digital world and in the larger geographic world is a lot of changes. But I also find People want to come back for that physical immersive experience, even no matter how much we love our phones and we talk about virtual realities, there's something about something you can touch, something that you can put your body into, where we saw a lot of our visitors just eager to get back into the physical museum once they could. Thank you so much, Tom. Beautifully said. And moving on to Peter. Professionally, I work at Epic Games on a video game called Fortnite that's pictured here. Um, if you follow video games at all, you've probably heard of Fortnite. It's it's a really massive game with uh, around uh, probably over 400 million players. It's generated over $20 billion over its lifetime revenue. So it's it's a massive game with a massive audience. I am one small piece of this of this organization that is building this. And my role is technical user interface designer. Um, so in, in video games, the user interface, if we can imagine like here is pictured, uh, some gameplay of, of Fortnite and you have, you know, a 3d simulation of a character running around with your friends, you're shooting things, you're doing, you're doing whatever the gameplay is and around the sides of the screen where there's, there's these indicators and these messages and these displays of your health and your weapons and your ammo. That's what we call the the user interface, and this is this user interface is um, the heads up display or the HUD. So I work on on creating that user interface um, in the game. If we can go to the next slide, the the other part of the user interface is is menus. Like this is this is the menus with your characters before you, in a lobby before you jump in the game. So all the menus as well are part of the interface, um, the user interface that that I work on. 
the the technical side of my role means that I work uh, directly in the game engine that um, that that makes the game. So I'm I'm working on, directly on the programming and with the editor to to build these UI systems and to also create tools to develop user interface in these games. So um, so yeah, that's that's what I what I what I do professionally. On the next slide, um, I also really like making my own smaller games with small group of collaborators and friends. Uh, these ones are often artistic, strange projects um, that, that I've worked on over, over the years. Um, actually, all the games here, so these are a bunch of games that, I've, that we've, we've put up for free on, on itch.io, which is uh, kind of a hosting website for, for independent games. This is These games are really like the com complete polar opposite to Fortnite. Fortnite's a massive project with you know, hundreds of developers. This is a, these are small games for, with with me and some friends building it, um, and and putting it out there as kind of like little explorations and experiments. Um, and a lot of these games were built from game jams. So a game jam is basically it's it's almost like a little competition where you have um, usually seventy two hours to make a game from scratch. You make all the art, you make the um, the animations and the music and the sound and the and the coding, and you put that all together and you come up with something. Now, a lot of a lot of these ones, it's like we we started these projects out of game jams and then we kind of developed it further to make it into something a little bit bigger and a little bit, a little bit more fixed and you know, fixing all the rough edges and the bugs and stuff like that. Um, but I, I feel like um, in my creative work, this kind of concept of the jam, both in the game jam and also just kind of creative jams of like putting putting constraints on yourself to make creative work within small amounts of time and throw yourself at um, kind of multidisciplinary fields of, you know, kind of throw yourself at music creation or art creating or writing and doing that within within a time period to kind of generate something interesting that you can then build off of is something that I've been experimenting with um, with collaborators for for a long time now. On the on the next slide, I think it's a it's a screenshot of uh, one of my games. So this this is this is a game that started as a jam, but then we built it up and we then we released it on iOS and Android. Um, and it's it's actually it's called City Glitch. It was, it's a really small little puzzle game. It was actually kind of based around chess or inspired by chess of your kind of moving um, a character around a five by five grid in all these different permutations to kind of solve these little puzzles and interact with these other entities within this. The idea is that you're on these little rooftops, but it has a super like pixelated low lo-fi graphics that we add like filters and shaders on to kind of give it this this like fluctuating um, kind of feel to its aesthetic. Um, so this is about five, six years ago, I think I we, we, we did this project. And the next slide is is another game that um, that I worked on um, called Dream Disk, um, which is I think I have a video on the next slide, so we can probably go to that to see it to see it in motion. Um, we can play it, and I'll I'll talk over it. But it's it's somewhere in between kind of pinball and golf. Um, I kind of imagined this kind of as a as a a game for. Um, like a, a game for your commute on the metro to be playing on your phone and you're bouncing around this little disc so it's going to come up here yeah so you enter you enter into these little like collections of um of these little squares with uh they have the 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 little bright one that that you hit is is a bumper that you're trying to hit and then you can move to the next square and you're kind of moving through this little these little like um abstract uh, worlds and they each have different color schemes and they each have different um, soundscapes to them as well. So they have kind of these dreamy uh, soundscapes to them of like you hear like um, the playground sounds in the background or like forest sounds or the sounds of the subway and stuff. So it was kind of about having this relaxing experience. Um, and uh, yeah, this was this was done, I think, a couple a couple years ago that we put this one out. Um, and yeah, continue to make uh, small game jam projects and and uh, use video games as kind of artistic experimentation. Thank you, Peter. What a beautiful piece and such an interesting uh, contrast in um, the kinds of work that you're actually doing. Did you always like to play games and always know that you wanted to move into this realm? 
I've always been fascinated with video games. I think even before I had my first like video game system, like console, I was imagining the games that I wanted to play and wanted to build. So it's always been, I've always been absolutely sucked into to video games for sure. And, and kind of found my way into, into a career doing that and, and also doing it on, um, on the side for my creative and artistic side as well. Really wonderful. Uh, you know, uh, Rockwell always, I think, enjoyed and appreciated the fact that many people um, saw his art at the same time, essentially. Do you have that feeling also of, um, you know, this maybe a satisfaction in knowing that many people are enjoying what you've done? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think like it's it's fun doing both types of work too, of like working on a project as big and widely popular popular as Fortnite and doing things that you know you know hundreds millions of people will play with and experience and that's really fun it's also fun to make kind of smaller projects but that are maybe like more personal like more personally centered around you or your experiences or your, your thoughts and to to hear people's reactions of that like people commenting on them and on on online platforms and kind of getting that feedback as well so it's kind of it's kind of nice in these in these two wildly different kind of um, degrees of visibility. I'd say it's it's wonderful, and in fact, um, you just answered that a little bit. But someone in our audience just asked, um, you know, if being a part of something like Fortnite, um, which is so globally popular, um, they kind of want to know what is that like. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's really it's really interesting i mean it's it's interesting on a lot of levels like fortnite um as a as a game uh production is has to have it has a massive amount of people working on it over over many <clears throat> over many years over many seasons of time so the project itself has to have all this all this tooling all this production means all this organization all these you know different directors and kind of the company kind of pushing this forward and figuring out where it's going next. And actually Fortnite's kind of going through uh, a change recently, which is that it um, it is becoming kind of a platform itself for other games. So it, it kind of has, it's always had kind of experiences within it, like like having virtual concerts within it, but now it's opening up to, to like games being done within Fortnite. Like there's this Lego crossover game, there's this, um, there's uh, racing games and there's creator made games as well. So you can actually open up Fortnite and build your own video games within Fortnite for your friends to play. So it's uh, it's it's really kind of a platform itself for a lot of different types of play experiences, I'd say. Thank you. Sounds very exciting. Well, I'm gonna bring our panelists back together again. Stop sharing the screen and um, hopefully everybody will be on board. Does anyone have any questions or comments for our speakers? Well, I'm going to just ask you one last question, which is, um, oh wait, I think we might have a question. Jeffrey has a question. Deborah, what is your question? Deborah? No, no, I, I, I have a question. I oh, want to know. Okay. I want to know from Jarvis what you know what sort of cake. What, what is Norman Rockwell's birthday cake? I see he's eating it without sharing it. <laughs> it's, it's delicious. It's delicious. It's a wonderful cake. I've, I've never had a cake like it. It's a carrot cake. Carrot cake. I just, I just keep picking at it. It's, it's marvelous. <laughs> it's Norman Rockwell's 130th birthday carrot cake. <laughs> sounds, sounds delicious. We wish we could share it with everyone. I, I, I think we have some carrots that may be 130 years old in the fridge. Uh, we could. <laughs> <laughs> They're good for the soup pot. There you go. I see that the Rockwell sense of humor has passed down for sure. Um, I do wonder whether you have all um, sort of throughout your lives and careers um, just felt that legacy aspect of. Um, of Rockwell's fame, is that something that you have thought about, or has it has it been um, really not not an issue or a question? Uh, 
yes, it has been. I mean, it's present. It's very present. It, it was interesting growing up in Italy. I think one of the reasons that my father moved to Italy and liked living in Italy was that people didn't know who Norman Rockwell was there. So it was sort of a little bit easier for him to be an artist there. Although that that exhibition that arrived in Rome was kind of that that changed that, right? So so now now more people in Italy know who Norman Rockwell is. But it's a comp it's 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 an incredible gift. It allows you to know, like it was never a question, could you make a living in the arts? Could you make a living doing something creative? So that's an incredible gift. But there also is that there's a certain amount of knowing what is possible because of art that can that can lead to some pressure. Uh, I would imagine, I, I would imagine some of the other folks on, on on the call might might have experienced that. But I don't know. I'm curious, Peter, whether you feel it like one more generation removed. I'm sort of grateful. I'm sort of grateful to be one generation removed or two, depending how you count them. And then you're one more. And, and of course, Jarvis is right there or was right there. Yeah, I've always found it as kind of a it's a fun it's a fun detail for people to find out often. Like if you're if you're studying art or something and people find out, oh, you're the great grandson of Norman Rockwell. It was always a fun thing to kind of bring up, but never something that yeah like i don't know like i feel like it probably applied a lot more pressure on the the direct children of norman and i think on um, i'm pressuring them but not not i don't think it's goes down to my generation as much it's just more something to be to be connected in. and i think i think the major thing is the just feeling that you're part of a family of artists and creators um that i feel has always inspired me and and just feels yeah it does feel like art was always something that you could go into and you could you could make a living off of. Great comments, thank you. Uh, I, we have a yes, Jeffrey. I, I was just going to add, you know, there. I never had any trouble as a philosopher of somebody thinking that there was some connection, but but one of the great things about Norman Rockwell and the fact that he was an illustrator and the variety of things he worked on is to me. It was always clear that there is art and design in everything that, you know, I, you don't have to be a great artist. You know, I, I, I spend a certain amount of time worrying about interface design. Uh, my son, Peter, does it even more than I do. Uh, and there's artistry and creativity there. And I think that was some of the legacy of having practicing artists, not just my grandfather, but my father, uh, my uncle Jarvis, having this, this variety. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from the famous illustrator Steve Brodner, who is probably today's uh, most prominent political illustrator. He is asking what you think Rockwell would have thought of AI today. Jeffrey, I think you've got to take that one, right? <laughs> i got to take that. Well, I, I, I think he would have... Um... You know, I think he would have cracked a joke about it, but I, I think he would have wanted to play with it. And then he would have probably done an illustration. There is at least one, there is a cartoon, and I can't remember exactly, but there's a cartoon with a computer and somebody. Uh, Margaret, do you remember the exact the, the exact detail? But I think I think he would sort of make fun of it and he would find a way to sort of show a different perspective on it. Uh, uh, and uh, there's so much hype now around AI that I think he would mock that in some way. I would say that's probably very true. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any further questions? Okay. Well, I want to thank you all so much for participating in this program today. It was um, so much fun to have you with us, to hear your thoughts about uh, both Rockwell and your own work um, we'll, we'll just look forward to keeping up with all the exciting news that you have on an ongoing basis. So thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you all for joining us too. Thank you. Thanks.